Thank you also for the invitation. And hello, everybody. Uh, what I'm going to try to share with you is precisely my sources of optimism. We're all dreaming of smart, green, fair, and global growth. Of course, that's where we would like the world to go towards. But we're also wondering if it can happen. And the thing is that my work on the history of technological revolutions is a sort a source of great hope because you know in the 1930s when franklin roosevelt was trying to to solve this depression recession unemployment poverty inequality all these horrible things and business didn't let him and the supreme court kept on putting down his laws and his programs and all these things uh, and then when the second world war ended every single thing that he proposed and even more imagination things happened things that were very difficult to believe uh, full unemployment insurance pensions people being able to buy houses the government backing all the uh, home building suburbanization all these wonderful things that happened that lifted the whole practically the whole of the population into good lives with business accepting. So sometimes you find that there is resistance towards change and then something happens, which I'm going to explain why in history this happens, that turns the tables completely and suddenly what seemed impossible becomes possible. So I'm going to share what I have learned from the history of technological revolutions. And there'll be five points. First, I'll talk about the revolutions themselves. Then uh, how the technologies are actually shaped sociopolitically each time. And then I will answer three questions. First, why smart and green together? Very often, the techies, all the people that are in the information technology seem to be living in one world and the greens live in another world. Well, we need to put these two things together because it's very important to be able to use the new technologies in order to achieve green. Then uh, I will wonder why we need it to be fair and global. Of course, all of us agree with that, but not everybody does. And I will argue why it could be that everybody will. And then why growth and which growth? And I will try to clarify why I am for growth, but of course, a particular type of growth, not just growth understood as the old mass production, resource intensive sort of growth, uh, human growth. So let's start with the five technological revolutions. There have been in 240 years. The first one was, of course, the Industrial Revolution, machines, factories, and canals. That was like the internet of the time. Then we have the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways, followed by the first globalization. That was the age of steel and heavy engineering electrical, chemical, civil, naval. That was the time when the steamships went north to south in two weeks and therefore incorporated the whole of the Southern Hemisphere into the capitalist economy. And also, of course, the transoceanic cables, the telegraph went through the ocean, uh, sort of like internet now. So that's how we had the first globalization. So it's important to learn from what happened then. Then we have with Ford's Model T, the beginning of the age of the automobile, oil, plastics, and mass production, which is the source of most of our environmental problems today. And then our current age of information, technology, and telecommunications. And if you will notice, the arrow is only halfway because we are only halfway. We've only come through what Schumpeter used to call uh, creative destruction. So you have the new technologies pushing through and eliminating everything that was there, but not really constructing yet the new society. And that's what we need to do with these technologies now. So each of these revolutions brings, on the one hand, a techno-economic shift, and on the other, a social institutional shift. And the social institutional shift is the one that shapes what really happens with that technology, with the technologies. What happens, though, is that the first half of each revolution is one of growing inequality. And the golden ages only come in the second half. 
So let's look at what the historical record reveals. It's a regular sequence of bubbles on golden ages. We have in the first half a bubble prosperity with increasing inequality and then the golden age, which is a win-win game between business and society. And in between, we have the post-bubble recessions because, because the bubble prosperity, of course, always ends in a crash or two or three, it depends how many bubbles we have this time. If we count the current COVID collapse, which if it hadn't happened, we would have had a financial collapse. We were ready for a financial collapse already. Uh, this recession in between is the time when all the problems of inequality come forth. Everything becomes visible. You have political unrest and populism, of course. Populism is nothing but people resentful because they have lost a lot of what they had and messianic leaders offering heaven and saying, I'm going to solve everything for you and people believing this. And also, of course, uh, xenophobia against any foreigner that stands in the way. All these things happen like in the 1930s. It, it could be the Jews, it could be the Muslims, it could be the Mexicans, it could be whoever you can find. And the leaders, of course, will be whoever comes up and gets as angry as you are angrier. So what do we have? We had Canal Mania, Canal Panic, and then the Great British Sleep in the First Revolution. And then the second, we had Railway Mania, Railway Panic, followed by the Victorian boom. Then many global booms, the Gilded Age, because that was the globalization. So in every country we had, we had collapses. And that is followed after the collapses and after the populism and all this mess by the Belle Epoque and the Progressive Era. Then we have the Roaring Twenties and the post-war Golden Age. And now we have already had the dot-com boom, the global casino, and this post-COVID collapse, which is going to be very difficult. But then after that, we could have a sustainable global ICT Golden Age, because that's where we are. We are just at the point when the golden age is ahead. So that's the good news. The adequate parallels then for today are the 1930s and World War II. So it's the post-war. We are, we are going to be in the post-war when we come out of COVID. And the golden ages depend on government policy providing direction. We do need government policy to do it. So what's this social political shaping of technologies then? Well, first of all, we have to understand that technology sets the stage and provides the tools. Forget about technological determinism in the sense that all you have to do is to adapt. Sometimes, you know, you get sort of desperate because the whole idea is, you know, there's going to be artificial intelligence. It's going to eliminate 60% of jobs. No, it isn't. It depends. It depends how technology develops how you shape technology socially. It's only a set of tools, but of course, there are things you can do with the technologies and the things you cannot do. And there are things you should not do because you have better ways of doing them now. But the shaping of the technology in order to bring about a golden age is political. That means that the outcome depends on social pressure. So civil society, political movements, and thought leaders play a defining role in the outcome. Obviously, in the end, it's those in power that take the decisions, but those in power depend on the support and the pressure that's provided by society. So what did we get with the mass production golden age? Well, we got employment, education, health, and security based on home ownership and mass consumption. So that was actually, that's that's the good life that brought the bad conditions for the planet. And we also not only destroyed the environment, but also excluded the developing world. What could we get with the digital golden age? Well, we could get all of that, but smart, green, plus meaning, creativity, social networks, lifelong learning, based on collaboration, access, rental, maintenance, recycling, and reuse, with an improving global society flourishing on a healthy planet. So let's see what really happens. I mean, in practice in that, in those free market installation periods and major bubble times. 
what we have is income polarization, just like we saw Sandrine just now show. This is the well-known Piketty and Saez, one of their graphs. We have here in the roaring 20s, this is the percent of income earned by the top 1% of taxpayers. Of course, what they declare, we don't know how much they really earn. This is including capital gains in the, in the US from 1913 until just two years ago. So we have here 25% in the hands of the 1% income. And here, this was in the 1920s. Here, it's the Nasdaq bubble, then the 2000s bubble. And this is what we've just had all this time, the same, around over 20% in the hands of the 1%. But look at this. In the post-war boom, we had the golden age of mass production and their share came down to 10%. Of course, that's a lot, but that's how you get wealth being created and then that's how you get prosperity. You need to get wealth, but not in this unequal form of distribution. So the question is, where are we going? Are we going to stay up here? Are we going to keep this inequality or are we going to have a post-COVID boom, the golden age of information? Well, golden age deployment periods reverse the process, of course. Will we do it again? That's the question. Now, why smart and green together? You know, the energy and materials intensive, unavoidably wasteful mass production revolution is the main cause of the threats of climate change and resource depletion. So the information revolution with the intangible nature of software and internet mobility provides the best set of tools to turn products into services and generally reverse the trends. So smart green lifestyles and production methods must lead the way. Let's look at some examples of smart green. Okay, first of all, we all know that we no longer use records or tapes or whatever. We have streamed music and films. We don't necessarily buy paper newspapers. We have online news and we also have digital books. So we're already talking about an enormous amount of materials that are no longer being used for us to be able to have access to these things. Rental and maintenance of truly durable goods. This hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. Although the EU does have something about uh, the companies having to take back electrical and electronic goods when at the end of their life, a certain percentage and so on, and some of it is disassembled, but we're far from what we need. We need really durable goods. We have the technologies to make goods last 100 years. We don't need to do spare parts. We could eliminate spare parts and just print them on demand with 3D printing. We should have maintenance and, and people just making sure that things last. And this whole idea of the uh, material goods being rented and maintained would change radically our use of materials and still we would allow all the people who don't have those goods to be able to have them because we could have with less materials, much less materials, cover the needs of the whole world. Computer-guided hydroponic agriculture around cities, we need and we can have fresh food. Interactive smart grids to control electricity usage. Uh, MOOCs, the online courses, another online teaching and learning, which would allow people in far corners of the world to have access to the top uh, teachers in the world. Virtual events and online meetings like what, the one we're having now and so on. So we can really go very far in terms of smart green, this new technology helping green happen. And why fair and global? I think we all agree that it has to be fair and global, but we need to understand a bit more because it's not just the humanitarian reasons as well as the practical reasons related to peace and profitability and all that. Because the angrier people get, the more complicated it is to have peaceful growth. And of course, if you don't have demand, you don't have uh, profitability. But we're all in this together. If the rise in crime, desperate migrations and populism have not convinced the world, the pandemic has, because we're all in this together with all those things plus health. 
So the post-war boom in the advanced world was the result of a fair income distribution in the North that created dynamic demand for profitable business. But it kept oil and materials cheap, holding the underdeveloped countries behind. So what we need now is to go towards creating this demand for the future green society. So what could be the measures for a fair global future for the information age? First of all, at least in all the advanced countries, universal basic income makes an immense amount of sense. Handle with artificial intelligence, no bureaucracy, no humiliation, dignity of every citizen used through, they get the money through the ATM and the reimbursement as tax. Anybody who earns more than a certain amount just gives it back and that's it. So everybody has the dignity of having a basic income in the across society. And we don't have, because people who are on, who are self-employed, who are in the gig economy, who are, they, they don't have a, a proper, they're not employed, they're not unemployed. So how do they declare that they need unemployment insurance if they are partly employed? So we've got to change that. Then we need good wages for service workers. We just discovered how essential they were for life and they will also be essential for demand. So we've got to change it. And you know, the reason why the assembly workers got good wages was social political. As soon as those jobs went to Asia, they became low cost jobs. They were not middle income jobs. They became middle income because of a social political decision to pay well. So, and of course, the, to, to make the unions be able to be industry unions and so on. We need to build many green affordable homes. It's good for jobs. It's good for well-being and it's good for the environment. Increase the prices of fossil fuels and materials, which will encourage materials and energy saving and will also help fund development. We need to set a financial transactions tax for a Marshall Plan to fund development. It would encourage investment and especially it would encourage an innovative sector in sustainable, adequate capital goods, which would serve the whole of the developing world. You know, the advanced world needs to have some specialization, which is different from consumer mass products, which is what Asia has taken over already. And to have cap sustainable capital goods is an enormous sector if and only if the whole of the developing world starts developing, because then they will need plenty of capital goods. So that would be a positive sum game and so on. And now the question of growth, why growth, which growth? It's a big question, growth. We have the whole idea of limits to growth. What, what are these limits and why do we need them? Of course, there is opposition to growth now for very good reasons. Uh, it seems to be moved by the greed of some and not the social well-being of the many highly destructive of the planet and wasteful, feeding a culture of excessive consumption and not self-improvement. The problem is that there is still too much poverty in the world. And the question is if it can be overcome without growth. Now, not measured by GDP or whatever, growth meaning more wealth creating activities, services, things for well-being. So which growth? One that aims at education, experiences, and healthy lives, that uses biodegradable materials and no waste, that aims at dematerialized consumption, that makes and maintains durable products for 100 years. I can assure you with the technologies we have today, every single durable product could really last 100 years. When I was young, uh, the refrigerators lasted 35 years without any problem. So why can't we with all the technologies now? And it has to be growth that aims at eliminating poverty across the whole planet. So yes, but a very different human-centered type of growth. We must set up a positive sum game between business and society, between advanced emerging and developing countries and between humanity and the planet and the post-pandemic reconstruction is the best moment to do so. Thank you.